privilege and opportunity to welcome all of you to today's webinar on government, government finances, government spending. It's a hot topic, it's an important topic, and it behoves all of us to be informed and aware of these things. And to our audience out there, thank you very much for being here. In a little while, I'll introduce our panel of experts to you. But thank you for joining us. Thank you for setting aside time, putting your lunch hour to one side, and listening to to to, to what we are going to be talking about today. I'm absolutely delighted to have you with us, and we will we will uncover and debate a great many things in the process. For those of you who are first-time viewers or first-time participants in our webinar series, uh, Regenesis is a, an independent business school. Its main campus is in Johannesburg, in Santon but it also has campuses in India and Nigeria, and we are starting campuses in Nairobi, Kenya, and in San Francisco in the United States. So we're a truly global business school, and obviously, we ran activity in the world right from certificates way up to bachelor's degree, masters, doctorates. And we realize that often many people who will come into contact with don't always have the opportunity to be able to interact with and talk to and hear, listen to experts in their various fields. And this is why we have this webinar series where we get experts in a variety of different topics and they come and share their knowledge with us. They do so freely, they do so without, without recompense, and we pass that over to you so that all of you in the audience get to do this without having to spend any money on it. And we can see that as part of our mission of being able to spread information, spread learning, spread education throughout the world. So if you've just joined recently, um, my name is James Forson. I'm Delighted to be the have a front row seat in our in our conversation today, and we've got two very very competent and experienced people talking to us today. Uh, you will see on screen uh, Dr. Petra Smith, and also we have uh, Professor Devu Zimabambi Devu speaking to us from Selenbosch. So I'm going to ask Professor Devu. I haven't had a chance to, to say good morning to you. My name is James James Wilson. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'd be delighted that you've joined us in the session today, and I know you're going to make a marvelous contribution. So let me just sketch out how we're going to run this over here, so because I'm sure there are people in the audience uh, who will want to ask questions as we go down the track, uh, and, and we, could, we will deal with that. We will deal with that. Unfortunately, Mr. Governor from KwaZulu Natal was unable to participate today. He's had a, a matter that he's had to deal with. In, in his home office and of course it's towards the end of the month so we can understand why why he would have these challenges there but we've got more than enough expertise in the room uh, with, with dr smith and with professor Devo over here so i'm going to ask each of you to our panelists to introduce yourself very briefly just tell us a little bit about who you are and the sort of work that you do and then we'll take it from there so i'm going to call on you dr smith would you just tell us in a few sentences who you are what sort of work you do and anything else that's interesting that goes with that, and then we'll go to Professor Ndevu. So do go ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to share some of my little bit of knowledge with everybody. Um, I have started in the city of Johannesburg in the year 2000. I have gone and I've been involved in various projects in various departments as well as municipal owned entities. I was responsible for the first clean audit, for example, in the city housing company, as well as in Job Theatre and in the revenue department as well. I've got quite extensive knowledge and database of how the full revenue stream works in the city of Job. And I always pride myself into trying to perform 100%. It's not always possible um, in, in my academics uh, 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 career. I've started out when I was a young girl with my first degree. I ended up doing my master's at Regenesis. I was just telling James that. And uh, then I went on to University of Free State where, where I did my PhD actually in the effect of leadership competencies on employee performances. And I did it within three municipalities in Cape Town, Swanee, as well as Joburg. It was a very difficult career, a very big thesis, over 500 pages. 
But with all that, um, I love what I'm doing. Uh, I love the finance stuff. Um, and yes, I am very honored to be here. Thank you very it's much. Lovely. Thank you, Dr. Spitzer. It's always a pleasure to welcome an alumna to our, our panels over here. And it just shows you how the Regenesis word is spreading around the world. Lovely. Thank you for that. Professor Ndevu, tell us a little bit about yourself, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Virinzi Mandevu. Uh, I am currently serving as a director of the School of Public Leadership. We are a school that focuses mainly on three areas, uh, which is public policy, uh, environmental governance, and also sustainable uh, governance. Uh, I I am a product of Stellenbosch University, where I got my PhD with Stellenbosch University. Before that, I've worked in other universities within the country. Uh, my areas of interest are really local government, uh, leadership. Uh, we have uh, undertaken a number of interventions in government, in all three spheres of government. Our biggest one currently is the municipal minimum competencies, which we do. Uh, in partnership with the National Treasury. So in a nutshell, that is me. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. That's, that's, that's a lovely introduction over there. And of course, uh, sitting up here in Khartoum, just a teensy, weensy little bit jealous of you sitting in the beautiful city of Selenbosch. But uh, we won't hold that against you. But thank you both for being with us. Before we go on to the thing, I'd like to introduce my co-host today, Hank Didricks. He looks after the School of Public Management. And say a few words to the people, Hank. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's really a privilege to be introduced so uh, so nicely by Mr. Forson. Uh, as you said, my name is Hank Ditherix. I am formerly head of the School of Public Management. I currently serve in a more a role more related to special projects within the Regenesis uh, Corporation as a as a whole. And I trust that you will enjoy our conversation today and that it will provide you with many great insights into the inner workings of both the public sector as well as the local government sector. Thank you very much for that. I think he's my co-host for the day. So if I run into trouble, he'll come and rescue me. So we, we, we're all safe today. We're all safe today. Good. Now, thank you very much. You will see some other names on the screen as well, too, some other participants from the school. And these are other senior people inside the school as well as our technical support people. And they're from time to time, they, they may come in and, and ask us some difficult questions. We will, we will definitely deflect to our, our, our panel of experts over here. But that's all the talking from the beginning we sorted out. Now, let's go into the details now. now. Uh, Dr. Smith has prepared a lovely, very short, very brief little presentation on public finance. And it would be it would be just a lovely way to bring all of us up to speed because we've got people here, lots of experience in, in government and, 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 and budgetary experience. And we have people who are first year students who haven't had a job yet. So let's bring us all together, Dr. Smith, if you would like to uh, post your, your, your presentation and just take us through it because it would be a lovely way there. And then I'll take ask uh, Professor Ndevu to comment on this and to, to expand on any things that, that he would want to comment on from his vast experience from sitting on the other side. So, uh, as, Thank you right. very much, sir. Right, so well, let's see Let's see if it's worked. I think we've given you uh, sharing the privileges of this. I'm sure it will come up in a moment. These things always take more time than you think. And there it is, we, we do visible. And do go ahead and tell us the story. Tell us the story, please. Okay, thank you for this. So I've, I've done a very high level presentation regarding how does local government budgeting work and what it's about. So if you look at the first slide, it technically uh, to budget is to have a financial plan and to make a prediction of what you're going to spend and what is your income going to be during that financial period. But if you actually look deeper into it, we find that it's much more than this. So why do we budget? We budget because we need to serve the community. There's the vision that the city has to give superior services to all its, uh, 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 to its community. And that's why the budget is this tool to actually uh, get to that and to actually yeah. deliver its roles according to what they plan and what they promise to the community. 
So, so basically, it, if you look at the, the budget process, it's also a financial plan. And it, like I said, it includes revenues, for example, taxes, uh, taxes being your, your sewer and your water and lights, all your services that you actually give to the community, which you will raise in the in an invoice, and then expenditure, for example, your infrastructure, other expenditures like your operational expenditures, like your salaries and stationery and things like that, and also other purposes which might include training and 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 uh, development on skills. It was it was interesting hearing about the skills audits and this. So the budget process begins with a preparation of a plan. This plan is usually done on departmental level and it outlines the government's goals and strategies. So you have a business plan in which you're going to outlay and which will be accepted at the mayoral committee and from this you need to find your budget that will feed into the strategies and goals in order to achieve what you've promised. And this is also not just for the community, it's also got political agendas to this. And I'm sure everybody always got the questions, what does the politician say in the background? So by after this, this is followed by a the development of a budget proposal. The budget proposal is then a consolidated approach which will be presented at the budget steering committee for approval. When people or when departments actually present this budget proposals, the budget steering committee will take into account what is outlaid in the development plans and the strategic objectives of the municipality or the local government. And according to that, they will then go, you will hear them say, oh, they cut the budget, we didn't get what we wanted. What they mean by that, they look at what is available and from that, they will then approve and allocate the budget to specific projects in the business plans. So once this budget is approved, it, be it becomes the basis of the municipality spending and the revenue decisions for that specific financial year. You will also find that, that the CAPEX budget, there will be the midterm budget, which will actually give budget projections over the three years for most products in, uh, or projects in terms of the Municipal Finance Management Act run over three years but it can go up to five years. So the impact on the local budget, on the public policy, can be significant. For example, a change in property rates, so if there's going to be an increase, it will affect the revenue. But also on the other side, it might have a negative effect uh, to, to the collection rates. I'm sure everybody heard about the collection rates because everybody will not be able to, to actually uh, afford it at this time. And also, if you if you look at uh, a decision increasing spending on police or fire protection, it can have a, a quite a, a huge impact on the safety of the public. Because if, uh, for example, the fire stations, you saw that City of Joburg bought, I think it was last year, quite a couple of fire engines. If there was no budget, we cannot respond to fires. So, going to the next slide, if I look at this, this is your steps in conducting an annual budget process that links to strategy. So, budgeting processes or approaches, you've got priority-based budgeting. So, that is, for example, where, where these projects that has a large impact on the of the living standard of the community. For, for example, water at the moment, water is a crisis or electricity is a crisis. That's why you will see city of Cape Town actually moving towards um, towards the, the uh, outsourcing the, the um, uh, electricity. Sorry, guys, let me just silence the stop. So oh, there's not a problem from the animals. This is one of the things they're working from home is that you have these exactly. lovely intrusions over here. And what usually happens when I'm teaching a class or something like that 
is this that the dog class stops and says, we want to see the dog, but we want to see the cat, we want to see the cat. <laughs> so these are the things that we've come very used to in the process of, 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 of online webinars and so on. So it's really not a disruption, and it just adds some human value to the conversation <laughs> and the interaction. So I'm sure your little Sorry. doggy is all happy now, and you can continue. Yes, thank you so much. So from there, if you, if you basically look uh, at the budgeting approach in a municipality, it should be zero-based budgeting. What does it mean? It means that every year you have to plan in advance and then start a budget afresh. But in my experience in the budgeting processes, this has not been happened in all the years I've been in the municipality since the year 2000. So basically we work on past experience and community demands or political pressure. So budgeting for outcomes, that is where you have to do something to deliver. For example, fixing the potholes is a good example, or building a new bridge, or implementing uh, lights, or something like that. So budgeting for outcomes, even your RDP houses will fall under this. Base budgeting, that's ex for example, your salaries, your salary is usually based on the previous year, plus an escalation for the next two or three years, which is planned usually three years in advance. So you're planning, then if you can see the step one, all in the bucket is the input from project or your program managers or project managers. So that is your guys that's usually in charge of your large projects, which will then submit the project plan and they would have done a demand uh, analysis and the needs analysis, as well as probably market related approaches to look what the market can offer and how other people do that. With this, what happens then, the, the budget committee has to review the request and then we also identify strategic objectives and gather all these things and put it together in the basket to make it our first planning process. From here, we finalize the proposed budget and send it to, to, to our budget steering committee, which is our legislative body. From here, step two, approval. The approval, and ladies and gentlemen, I must tell you, we in the midterm process, which started, say, the end of November. It is now the end of May and we haven't we haven't finalized it so depending on what happens especially in your political arena because we had the shifting from one political party to another and back to another our budget has not been finalized it hasn't been approved but usually it takes about three to five months but it could take long, longer so your budget steering committee will review all the budgets in detail whereby i told you guys before that the units and departments will have to go and present and they will they try and uh, um uh, how, how can I say, they will try and propose ways in which the budget can be used and they will also try to get this approved because everybody wants this budget. But the, the, the uh, uh, downside to this is everybody don't spend it and I will tell you a little bit about that later. We also, when you, when you actually uh, go and submit your budget for approval, uh, you need to be able to also present it to the public should it have impact on 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 the public's uh, quality of lives or for example especially rdp housing or sewer connections and electricity stations all those will have public input so you present this to the public because we are a public entity our money or the money that the city gets is not only for like a private company for, for for the workers and the shareholders but it's also it's public money so that is important so once all the step steps has been uh, uh, has been um taken then only the budget steering committee will make the final decision and approve the budget from here the budget will be sent to the, to the departments or to the budget office where the budget office then will send the approved department or the approved budget to all departments and municipal owned entities in the city. And then it will be implemented and captured. And from there, what happens? 
we need to evaluate, review. You set KPIs. So all of a sudden, you've got a target. Your target is to spend 97% of your CapEx budget. You've got $1.5 billion to buy vehicles. You need to spend that within 12 months. Now, you see what I'm talking about, the three to five months? you already five months into the next year. And you've got only that little window to spend that 1.5 billion and from here your tender processes kicks in which is very very uh, uh difficult because you have to follow step by step the tender the supply chain process which might take six to twelve months already so year one your budget your time is gone and you didn't spend your budget so please keep that in the back of your mind. Good, good. <laughs> so when you review and report your budget, so on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, half yearly and annual basis, you will report performance against budget. So uh, especially comes around about uh, like now the midterm budget, you will actually start in November and get all your units in your departments because the department may comprise of different units so they will come all together they will plan the budget they will present at the end of november to go through the step again to get approved so the midterm budget is implemented so come january february or say around about march you already start the end of the year budget again so it's a continuous ongoing processes that change the whole time during the uh, during the year apart from this you can also ask for transferring your budget or reallocating your budget to another line item in the municipal or the public sector you call okay. your general ledger accounts about it was very difficult for me to, to first understand it, but it's a vote. <laughs> so, but that is your general ledger, so you can reallocate your budget within the perspective little pocket uh, uh, package. So you've got right, repairs right. and that stays and stays there, or operating or capex, you may okay. be able to move it. And then, of course, after you've got your year in, you will have an independent uh, review of your, your uh, auditors to check your uh, your ledger and and your financials but basically that is all of it lovely now thank you very much for taking us through that that's that's been very helpful and i think that's brought us all to to common understanding of some of the issues underpinning this so we've dealt with a lot of things that we might have to address in other ways now before we go and hear from professor devu i know he's wanting to comment on this to our audience out there those of you who have arrived late welcome Thank you very much. My name is James Fawson. This is the Genesis Business School, and we talk about financial management best practices, financial reporting, and budget planning in, this, in the public sector. And of course, as these things do, we talk about whatever needs to be spoken about. So welcome to all of you out there. If you please put some questions in the question box at the bottom, those of you on the Zoom platform, for those of you on the, the Facebook platform, that might be a little bit difficult, but we will make a plan to, to, to see how we can get you on board. But certainly those of you on the Zoom platform, please do that. Now we've had this this this, this whistle-stop tour through the governing budgeting process. And of course, local government is near and dear to all of us because that's close to where we were. That's where government touches us. Professor Ndevui, how would you like to develop this further? What, what particular part of this would you like to comment on and expand upon based on your experience and the work that you do and research that you do? Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. And also let me thank my colleague who has eloquently presented uh, the budgeting process and outlined what are the issues that one should look at in the budget. I would like to just make a few additions. Please. Yes, in the good. public sector, our, our budgeting processes is pro-poor. So our budget would typically be a budget that is focused on the needs uh, of the community. In most cases at the local government level, it would be uh, the majority or the people that would need services the most. And that's the reason my colleague talked about the issue of consultation, because it should be a consultative process. It should be a budgeting process where different stakeholders are consulted uh, to ensure that the budget is realistic, firstly, uh, 
The budget is responsive to the need of different communities. The budget is reasonable. The budget is attainable as well. Because it, it, it does not make any sense to develop a budget that you know that you might not have the resources to be able to finance uh, your plan. Because a budget is typically a plan uh, or a finance mechanism for the municipal's short-term, medium-term, and long-term plan. So it's a mechanism that helps you in financing that. What we have seen in the South African context in terms of local government is that due to lack of expertise, uh, in finance generally and in budgetary processes to be more specific we've seen that because of that uh, many institutions have struggled to develop budgets that are proper or they've struggled to implement a budget once they've developed a budget it becomes very clear to stick to that budget process and implement the budget adequately and that becomes a very big challenge uh, either the focus of revenue that they're going to receive, ultimately develop a plan informed by that revenue they're going to receive, or uh, the focus of the needs that needs to be catered for within that budget, that becomes a challenge. And you also find another big challenge, as my colleague has indicated, council is the final arbitrary, is the final determiner in terms of the budgeting process. So council will ultimately uh, you find sometimes that council is not well equipped to be able to deal with the budget. So you have councillors, you have a budgetary committee that is not well equipped to be able to deal with finances. Either not understanding the legislative imperatives in terms of your municipal financial management act uh, at local government level or your public financial management act at provincial and national government level uh, and other provisions of the law. Uh, that talks to the budgeting process, your intergovernmental relations, uh, fiscal relations, for example, a number of other uh, pieces of legislation that they might not have appreciation of those legislation. And as a result of that, you find that uh, there is going to be challenges with the implementation of the budget. There is also going to be excessive corruption uh, as a result of that. We've seen that also happening at the sphere of government at local government level. The AG, in his most recent report, which was a report reporting on the previous financial year, she has reported that many municipalities are struggling to manage their funds, are struggling to manage funds that they receive from provincial and national government uh, because of the lack of expertise that I've talked about earlier on, that uh, many of them are using consultants uh, to develop budgets that they don't even understand as implementers and that might also be a challenge uh, that people do experience so your budget must be realistic must be reasonable and must be attainable thank you lovely i can just imagine our, our uh, the bachelor of public management students furiously taking notes over there because these are the sorts of things that come up in the exam and you've pulled that together very nicely over there and of course, modern society is very complex, whether you're talking about a provincial department or a city or a town, it's, it's complex. There are a variety of things that have to go together. There's legislation, there's finance, and you really almost have to have institutional knowledge about this. And of course, I'm, I'm so pleased what you've done there, Professor Dev. You put the C word out there, corruption. And we put it out there in the open. I'm sure we'll come and, and slide across that over there in the course of the next time over there. But that's a very masterful uh, putting together over there in terms of of how you, the, particularly around it, that, that the purpose of government is to govern for the people. And I like the way you put pro poor right up there on top of the agenda. You're talking about dealing with the stakeholders and being able to get the equitable share so that everybody feels equally hard done by by this. Everybody's about the same grumpiness about the budget, if you really want to phrase it in that way. So that's been a very nice kick off between you, Dr. Smith, and for you, President, you, you've kicked us out now. Now we're in the field. Now we're playing the game over here. And this is where I, I, I lean on my, my excellent colleague here, Hank Didricks, head of the School of Public Management, and he's going to pop a question to us. And while he's busy bouting to phrase his, his words on that out there, obviously I'm extending an invitation to everybody out there who is party to this to put your questions over here because this gives life and depth and substance and, and urgency to the discussion. But for the moment now, we will hear what Hank has to tell us. Hank, go ahead. Uh, good morning, Dr. Smith. Uh, I think from our side, uh, given the challenges that both you and uh, Professor have have addressed, um, what can what are the sort of the priorities that are considered when 
dealing with the budgeting process, uh, what what is given more presence over uh, over other issues, and then also how does the governance uh, legislative acts how do these determine the division of revenues? Thank you for the question, but I think Professor Nedu is going to help me with this answer. <laughs> I, if, if, I, if I look at priorities, um, you know, it's been shifting the whole time. And, and I think the major impact that we had, especially in Johannesburg municipality, is the political shifts. And every... All our priorities and agendas change every time leadership change. And I see there's a question also regarding this. And yes. the thing is, for us in the, in, in the administration, we don't have control over that. Because unfortunately, you have to go back again to your mayoral committee, and you have to go back again to your MMCs, and you have to go present again. And every time the priorities change, this one might want to first uh, do the potholes, and I'm using simple examples, but the other one first want to do the water issue. The other one first want to do the electricity, and the other one just care about buying fire trucks. So it's been very, very difficult, and I'm, I, I must be honest that over the last three years, I don't think that I can remember that we met our expenditure budgets in the last three years because of this major shift so so but the the business plan usually sets the priorities and and like the first thing is of course and i'm glad i actually forgot about our pro poor as we first look at the quality of our community and i think enhancing the quality of the community is usually on the top of the head of all political parties so as soon as you have the community happy, then you would start performing and you will have better backup when you go into the next political, uh, 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 what do you call it, um, uh, uh, arena. So as, as soon as you get there, well, I, I can't even say what is our priorities, but it's just to develop housing is one of the most important Good. ones. Okay. Good. And then, then our service delivery in terms of water, in terms of electricity. But, uh, well, from a personal personal view of point, it has not been met. Um, I think the local government has failed quite a lot lately. And that is mainly because of the leadership. And I don't know what the solution is. I would propose that the administration and the political officers should be separated more. And there shouldn't be so much interference into the administrative side. Um, okay. In terms right. of the acts, remember, we've, we've got a municipal finance management act. You've got the uh, PFMA. You've, you've got all this acts that actually sets down the time frames for all these processes. But even as soon as the shift in government happens, that our time frames aren't met. So it's, right. so it's been a very, very difficult It's a difficult time. situation, isn't yes. it? Yeah, yes. that's right. Because what you're saying there links in very nicely to the question that you know, Lube has put into the, the, the panel area. He says, thank you. My question is in relation to coalition governments who may stay with us for a long time. What can be done to be sure constant change of leadership does not affect the process, which links in the thing you've raised there, Dr. Smith. But I'd like to wheel this across the room to the other side of the room to, to Professor Ndevu, uh, sitting where he is out there, because I think this is an area that, that he's had a lot of experience in. And maybe you'd like to comment on this. I, it's, it's, it's going to be a current topic. We're going to be talking more about this as we go along. And I'm sure you will have something to, to add to this. Yes, uh, maybe just to add on what uh, Dr. Smith was talking nice. about on the priorities quickly, and then mm -hmm. I, I'll take that question. I think um, we also have what we call the IDP, the Integrated Development Plan, and that's typically what informs the program of local government. Your budgeting must be linked to the priorities that you've identified in the IDP. 
And if that is there is a G joint there, mm -hmm. and we see in practice, and Dr. Smith rightfully said that political parties would not hit uh, the fact that there is a plan in place and uh, the budget process finances the plan. And around the coalition government, I want to agree uh, with the comment that was made on the comment chat box that we will have these with us for a very long time. Uh, it is becoming very clear. Uh, but the challenge that we have, I think, is that they are not pro programmatic. They are not around. They are not coalition governments uh, built on programs. We know that they are not even built on ideologies. Uh, and that's the biggest challenge, that they are built on people trying to get position. So it is a jackal around position. And that is why they are not stable. We need to get to a point where uh, they are program orientated. Uh, people join. Uh, uh, they jointly govern because they've got shared or common goals. Uh, that they want to achieve and in that sense you get stability and i think we as the voters have a big role to play in that to ensure that we put in place political parties and uh, that have a proper agenda and that agenda is then a shared agenda uh, you don't see in the city of johannesburg every second month you have a new mayor i mean that <laughs> that talks to you know uh, to affecting government governance negatively so what yes. we need to do we need to have a pragmatic program that would ensure that, uh, because the poor are the ones that are suffering the most if there is no stability, because decisions are not taken that's supposed to be taken. So we need to have a program-based coalition governments. You know, Professor David, you're saying such a powerful thing over there, and I wish we could put this in neon signs around all the cities of our country around this is pragmatic approach, because you have political parties who vie for power, you have an IDP, which is more or less a stab at what needs to be done. It's a sort of it might not be the best uh, formulation, but it is a formulation of what needs to be done, the programs, activities, resources, and the budgets that go around. And that just seems to unravel, doesn't it? It just seems to fall apart and it doesn't quite pull together. And it's, I think we, we, we've outlined that part of that is probably political interference, but probably there's there are also other things that, that deflect from that. And the, the good intentions of the IDP don't necessarily filter through to the people who should be receiving them. Um, uh, Dr. Smith, would you like, you you want to come back with a repost over there? You want to go and defend the city of Johannesburg now with his no, no, no. mayors? <laughs> well, that, uh, the people are asked, what have we done to deserve that? But <laughs> I actually yesterday posted a question to one of the colleagues who was questioning a process that we implemented. And I said to her, does it mean that when leadership change, processes and policies change? And I think I want to actually pose this question to everybody here and let's see what responses we, we get, because it might be the reality, but should it be the reality? Thank you. That's a very interesting question, uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, just to add to, to the discussion uh, regarding the changes in policy with the coalition governments, how does the, the spend and the use or non-spend of budgets, how does that change during the run-up to elections? We have a, a, a national election coming up next year and in most other departments, uh, I do see that when, when you just look at the news, a lot of things do seem to change as elections near, um, especially from the ruling parties, uh, the, the main opposition parties take different stances. So how does that impact the use or non-use of budgets in the public sector and, and as well the local government sector? And Rush, you can all have a chance to chew at this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what I've experienced, and I want, want to use the classic example of the fire trucks again. Mm -hmm. If you look, or if I go back about five years ago, um, the state of the emergency response vehicles wasn't very good. Even, <clears throat> even if you look at the JMPD vehicles and that, it wasn't very good. So what happened just before election is the people in charge of the vehicle section and the vehicle uh, um, department was pushed to implement this just before elections. 
So just before elections, I think there was three or four very big fire trucks bought and some waste trucks and um, emergency response trucks and a very big marketing initiative followed this, whereby the public was being made aware that something was done by those people to actually service the public. So what I'm saying, the shift changes. For example, now, this year, we had a 200 million budget for vehicles. It was moved to next year. It was next year come elections. The plan to implement this has already been started rolling up. So in order then to make the parties or the political agenda or plans being seen and heard of, I would then think that you do it at the right time to actually make sure that the public knows you're doing something for them. And then, of course, you have to communicate it. You have to market it. You have to put it out there so everybody see what you're doing. That's exactly the thing where political parties go out and all of a sudden they give out. Uh, I actually don't, shouldn't say this. But, but they, <laughs> when they go and give a lot of T-shirts out just before elections, it's exactly the same. It's just on a more expensive and larger scale. Because if I see the uh, DA goes out and all of a sudden here in my area is a lot of visible policing, then it will be in mind, of course, I'll vote for them. Um, in my experience, whenever there is time for coming for elections, there's usually a big project that somewhere is kicked up and being done so that people can see somebody is doing something. But isn't that a problem not. worldwide, really? It is. We look at it, it, democracies and countries around the world, and it's, it's I don't know whether we just, be, be, with the social media and connectedness has just been able to bring out things that have previously been hidden, but we get to see a lot more of these things, and they're not just in South Africa, the other countries. We can pick half a dozen countries off the top of our heads around this, where this process of the connection between the people and the people's needs and the people in power has fallen apart, that con connection over there has fallen apart. And so you then get these grand gestures of buying a fire truck, whereas, you know, for most people in Johannesburg properly, who have to travel to work backwards and forwards by taxi, not having potholes in the road would make a lot more difference than a fire truck. And so you get these grand gestures that don't do this, but does it really go towards good government? And with that, then good governance as well, too. And those things speak to each other directly and indirectly uh, in, in part of that process. Professor Endeavour, if you wanted to help that further, because you, you can just sit on top of all of this. You, you're not just looking at it from a local government point of view, you're looking right across the country. You've seen this process. To develop that further for us and, and, and give us your insight as to the underlying problem over there. And what you see is, is, is not just the cause, but where some glimmers of hope can come in, it's particularly as we're framing it now in the run-up to elections and the possibility of coalition government. So I've given you a very broad mandate to speak about a whole lot of things. So you just take it and run with it. Thank you very much, Program Director. I think for me, maybe just going back a step, one step back uh, to the question around uh, 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 whether policy uh, does change when a new government comes into power or when, a, when there's a change in government and we see we change in coalition and all of that. Um, in an ideal world, and I'm, I'm using this particular phrase carefully, in an <laughs> ideal world, um, that should not be the case. Remember, uh, politicians are not really experts in local government, but officials, employees are experts, and they are the ones who help in developing these policies, uh, who craft these policies in a manner. Uh, so there should be continuity. In fact, there should be long-term plans for even a local government where even if a new government comes into power, the priorities might slightly change, but must follow the trajectory in terms of the long-term plans. In practice, we don't see that happening because uh, there is this uh, uh, issue around 
political expediency where people want to just to be seen to be delivering and that's the unfortunate part uh, that uh, the reprioritization of the budget and so forth and so forth to get uh, things to be bought just before elections and so forth and so forth so that that becomes a very big challenge i think one of the mistakes that we are seeing at local government you don't need any a prerequisite or pre-qualifications before you become a councillor. The only qualification you need is to be popular and get elected. I think for me personally, that's very problematic. That a person does not need to have any inherent knowledge uh, in that space to be able to operate in that space. That person has to, if he's a councillor in the city of Johannesburg, has to make a decision on a budget of millions when they have no expertise whatsoever, how do you expect this person to take such decisions? So we need to start there to look at what kind of counselors we have. Are they fit for papers? Uh, and ensure that we get people that are fit for papers. Are our institutions fit for papers? I think we have officials that have uh, the requisite expertise. Uh, they need just to be given space to do what they have expertise in and operate. And we don't see that happening. With government and all spheres of government, we're seeing that happening even at provincial and national government level. Uh, there is uh, there is no clear line between politics and administration. So especially at local government, because politicians are very close to administration. So they could uh, interfere in administration and get away with it. Uh, because nobody says, so we need to just ensure that we deal with that. I, I, I do think that there is hope. Our democracy is maturing. Uh, the fact that people are now not comfortable with one party rule, that already tells us that uh, there is some clumps of hope. Uh, when uh, smaller parties are given an opportunity to also have a bigger say in how government is run, that becomes a very important uh, component that we should appreciate uh, of governance. So in that sense, there is uh, a glimpse of hope that we're seeing. Uh, we want to see more of professionalization of local government, where the professional expertise are appointed. It doesn't become a soft learning space where politicians can appoint their friends, where nepotism becomes very high, especially uh, when it comes to the accounting officer and some of the important people that are appointed there where you see a lot of nepotism. If we can move away from that space, then we would be able to have governance with uh, what I call head, heart, and hands. So they would have empathy, mm -hmm. you know, able to do things for people. And that's what we want to see. Good, good. I like what you're saying. And also your point about the, the council expertise that you actually don't need to have a qualification or background or experience and probably experience and competence is more important than a qualification sometimes in politics we get a bit bogged down with qualifications but it's really experience around that and again the professionalization that is a, a difference between the political heads in the department and the administrative heads who get the things done are the professional civil servants government servants who go and get things done and i think you're absolutely right there professor and Deborah, that we are still a maturing democracy. I mean, we've been basically a late teenager. I mean, with all the problems and challenges of a late teenager, we are in that position and we are, are dealing with these things over there. And I think your point is, is very important about that is a professionalization of the, the administrative officials who can stand up to, um, to, 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 to political heads on the basis of that's not in the act or that's not the legislation or the regulations and being able to, to, to stick to the processes that are in required out there. We have got a lovely question here from Edwin Molebale, and uh, I think this is this, this tickles on to what we've been talking about now. Now, so let's see how we can take this further over here. Edwin's comment is as follows: I think there will always be difficult to spend the proof. It will always be difficult to spend the proof budget on time due to the continuous change of political leadership. And we will never see the end to corruption. Oh dear, that's that's it. That's a negative slant out there. But we, I'm sure, we'll be able to deal with that. Sadly, the poor and the vulnerable are harshly affected uh, due to absence of service delivery. And I think that that's it. When your comment there summarised so many of us in South Africa of the, that it's 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 not just you know the rich people, wealthy people always take care of themselves. The top one percent, the top five percent, but it's the poor people who are struggling with everything from from the power outages, load shedding, through to the doubt in the economy, the rand going up, administrative prices going out of hand, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how, do we, how do we give Edwin some hope in this? How do we help him 
to, 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 to look, have something to look forward to. Corruption, I big C. To this question. <laughs> big Sorry? C, I should actually show it like this, big C. Yeah. Corruption. Yeah. Yes, there's corruption. And the fact that the political arena pushes the, the projects, especially the big ones, makes it easier for the people to be corrupted. The thing is, yes, we identify it. What is absent? is that the people are being held accountable for what they have done. If we can implement something where the people who has done something wrong are, receive the penalty that's due to them, then it will change. Otherwise, those people stay there, same position, get higher positions, and they still corrupt, and nothing gets done. That is the problem. That's that's very bleak and sad. There, uh, is there some way we can find some 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 joy in this before we go into Trevor Lube's question? Yes, he's got another question over there. Um, you know, is is will the maturing? You know, we've got an election coming up now, and this we can be seen where people have to 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 adapt their approaches to this. Is no longer you no longer be accepted to be in power, and you've got to make things. Out. Is that going to make it worse, or is it going to make it? better for the poor the ordinary person in the street literally in the street uh, to, to have a better quality of life and i mean we're straying off the topic of this but i, I just want to, 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 to follow that through and then we'll go to 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 to, to the, the question in the question box but i just want to see uh, professor endeavor i can see you on the edge of your seat over there you, you want to get in, <laughs> take that one you want to take that one so go for it no i i think for me um the issue of corruption is, is a cancer that is eating our society on a daily basis because uh, resources that ordinarily would have gone to provision of services would now to go to the pockets of the few. Uh, and that, that is a problem. But also the biggest problem is that our law enforcement agencies uh, take very long to deal with instances of corruption uh, in such a way that, uh, you know, there is no uh, will really for me there is no will either political will and sometimes administrative will to deal with instances of corruption uh, you see people moving from one municipality uh, to another with a dark cloud hanging on their head and they are still employed we should ensure that we isolate those people that are found to have uh, acted in a manner that is not acceptable and ensure that they are not employed in another municipality because in many instances they tend to do the same thing I think this issue of corruption brings us to societal values. Once we start accepting uh, that these issues are things that are acceptable in society, the values of society allow these things to happen, then you are going to, this would not subside. We should start saying people without integrity, people that are not honest, should not be operating in our public institutions. I say to my students, if you can't manage yourself, if you can't manage your, your resources, we can't expect you to manage public resources. So it starts with me being able to manage my resources first. And then I'm able to manage these big public resources that I entrusted to. So that should be something that we try and infuse in our people and more especially officials. Anita, you're really talking to a fiduciary responsibility, the duty of care, the duty of diligence, the duty of trust, to be able to to fulfill that role to the best of your ability. And we seem to have lost that. It's a, it's a scramble for, for either shortcuts or to be able to, to get some, some rent-seeking process in place to, 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 to short-circuit it for self-enrichment. And again, the, I suppose there's some sympathy for people who were living under apartheid for many, many years who didn't have access to resources into this, and now there's opportunities. I'm, I'm not blind to that. But it's just that it, it, it's, again, for me, the measure is not how much I get out as a citizen get out, but it's how the poor, how the people underprivileged, people who don't have access to resources, who haven't had the opportunities for education, how they get to, to have to be able to sit at the table, enjoy some of the things of the good life. And I'm just seeing too few people sitting around that table at the moment for that. Um, I know Hank wants to get in here at the moment, but, but let me just put this other question we've got here in place, because it's sort of... 
tacks on to what we've been talking about, and this is another one from Noah Nube on our side. Trevor or Noah asks us, what measures have or have been put in place to make sure that the budgeting process is inclusive and the public has a say? And I suppose that goes to the creation of the IDP. And really, that is where we as citizens, I mean, from time to time, you see the city of Johannesburg, they have public meetings, and they say, what do you want to see? Uh, does any, anybody in the room want to take that one in and run with it? It also goes back to legislation. You must remember that the legislation that's in place in terms of your PFMA and your MFMA actually compiles you to do your budget according to the process. And you need yeah. to prove that you have done it in the correct ways. So, yes, that measures are in place. It sometimes just takes very long. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to bring Henk in over here because we spoke earlier on about the consequences and Hinks and Professor Kambuwa and other folk on the team are part of running the School of Public Management. What do you see coming up from the students around these things as you, you teach and you work in the classrooms and, and talk to folk about these things? Uh, yes, thank you, Professor Forson. Uh, I think... Uh, not a well, professor. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a citizen. I'm an ordinary sorry. citizen. Me, I am. Left the force. No, just uh, James. Apologies. James uh, is good enough for me. I'm, 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 I'm almost decided upon you a, 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 an advanced degree. No, no it's, it's, we must never pretend uh, to think, be something that we're not. <laughs> Go ahead. I I'm think from, you. from the student's point of view, there's definitely a, a clear movement towards <clears throat> awareness of what is going on. Uh, I think our students have really raised any issues throughout the classrooms, whether they be in terms of finances, whether they be in terms of human resource development, uh, all of the different modules that have been addressed, you do see that there is a great concern regarding what Professor Ndebu mentioned earlier, that there is individual or there are individuals in the public sector, working in the public sector, who have not been properly trained or do not possess over the uh, required qualifications, whether there are requirements for these uh, respective positions is a, is a matter for, for another day. But there is, there does seem to be an awareness that, you know what, I'm studying in, I'm sitting here in a class, I'm trying to uh, obtain a qualification, I'm putting in late nights, trying to get all of this information and knowledge into my head, and in the end, uh, individuals are voted into power without having obtained this uh, knowledge and uh, expertise, which really raises a concern. And I would like to pose this question to Professor Ndevu uh, fr from your side. What, what is currently being done to address this issue? You mentioned that people are being voted into power without the necessary qualifications, but how how is local government and the public sector, uh, for that matter, actually addressing this uh, in terms of training individuals whilst they're already in the position and uh, conversely also then preventing this sort of thing happening or from happening uh, going forward? How, how are they actually, what measures are being put in place to ensure that individuals that do come into power uh, are actually properly qualified? Yeah, that's a nice one. Uh, um, what we have seen in the previous election, the mm. local government elections that happened, I think last year, was that political party have been screening their candidates. They have actually been uh, set aside some form of, uh, not all of them, but some of them. Uh, you can talk about the big ones, uh, the DA and the ANC, for example, have been screening their candidates uh, to see whether these people meet some of the minimum requirements that we talk about that are not official. But I think even then, uh, those political parties did not follow their own uh, policies that have taken decision to screen councillors. I mean, uh, there are a number of examples that we can make of people that have ultimately been appointed as mayors. And they indicated in their policy document that uh, people who are going to be appointed as mayors must at least have a university degree. They've appointed people without that. Uh, 
The second thing is that uh, there is training that is done by local government, especially SALGA, to empower councillors. Uh, but uh, I have been involved in facilitating one or two of these induction workshops, and I realized that most of the councillors are really not interested. Uh, they don't engaging. It is a tick box exercise, which is very sad that people are just there to just tick a box that they have been attending this workshop, but they don't engage. They are not willing to learn from this process. Uh, and also there is this challenge of uh, because local government is close to the people, is close to uh, some of the structures of political parties, you, you seem to find uh, political office bearers who are more senior to officials, uh, like an accounting officer, for example, who would give instructions when ordinarily they should not be doing that. And that exacerbates the, the problem that we have. So clearly, uh, there are still challenges. We still have a long way to go. But I'm hoping that the community would play its role in ensuring that they hold councillors accountable. Good. No, thank you for that. And I see there's a lovely question from Ndeke Mulitsane. Yeah, but before we go to Ndeke's question, I want to take what you've said now, Professor. I want to throw it into the room. So while we're addressing Ndeke's question, let's, I want the, the audience to think about this. And I'm sure there are some senior civil servants in the room who are watching this uh, over um, What's your response to this in terms of professionalism, in terms of developing civil servants, uh, government officials? Uh, what's your stance towards that? And where do you see the opportunities and where do you see the, the, the improvements that have happened over there? So I'm leaving that's homework for the people out there watching over there. While they're busy thinking about that, let's go to Ndeke, Ndeke Mulitsane. Uh, and obviously Ndeke is a student of ours, so we're delighted that you are with us, Ndeke. Professor Kambua taught us about new paradigm shift from process driven approach to new management and systems theory approach to be infused into all public servants and will appointed public servants and the constitutional obligations that flow from there including the mfma and the pfma i'm not even sure i understand that but i'm people people in the room will be able to make sense but who's going to who's going to grapple with that one i think i can attempt <clears throat> I, I I was hoping you would do that. It's, it's right up your street, isn't it? <laughs> I, I think um, uh, the approach is correct. It, it is we are moving away from uh, being uh, mechanic mechanistic about approaches of dealing with issues mm -hmm. in the public sector because of the complexity of issues at that level. And I think uh, because we live in a globalized uh, world. Uh, the challenges that are experienced by people in the city of Johannesburg uh, might be similar to challenges that are experienced by people in another part of the world. So we need to adapt to conditions, ensure that we don't reinvent the wheel in dealing with issues that we're dealing with. Uh, so you have, for example, seminars such as this one, where people can share knowledge and expertise, and out of that, people can go back and implement some of these things. So we all learn from each other, and we ensure that we improve the system of governance uh, in, within the public sector. So I think uh, we should move from the mechanistic approach to more um, an approach that uh, is fit for peoples. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's such an important message that because it's both hink with you, this, the School of Public Management of Genesis, and you, Professor Ndevo at Sillenbosch, you've all got this role to play. You know, your work is not done yet. You've got an important role to play in, in just continually just putting out students who have the right technical skills and managerial skills, but also the right ethical understanding and approach to this. And, you know, you both of you are doing such important, important things around that. But Edwin has come to our rescue again. Edwin, thank you for your comment. Let's, let's deal with your question over here. Let's read Edwin's comment over here. The role of national and provincial governments, including Solga and municipalities, through Back to Basics programs, now district development model. Senior managers are deployed and camping in municipalities. Does their role and responsibilities still relevant, or are, I presume are their roles and responsibilities still relevant because we see municipalities degrading and going down in their presence? So it's the back to basics program, the district development model. Um, I don't know anything about that, but we've got lots of expertise in the room. Is this going, is this working? Is this helpful? The district development model, it's a very fairly new model. It's a model that was introduced about two years ago. Uh, I think it, they have been in 
two pilot projects, right? one in Limpopo and um, I think one in the Eastern Cape, those two pilot projects that have been undertaken. Uh, but the idea around the district development model is to ensure that there is coherence, there is alignment in terms of planning from national, provincial and local government. I am not sure whether in practice that is possible. As uh, the person who posted the question, you have uh, senior officials from provincial and national government being placed in local municipalities doing duplicate work that is also done by officials in the municipal level. So we would have to look at uh, the process flow uh, maybe it should change. Uh, I don't think this duplication would help uh, because it's going to create some tear for some people being uncomfortable with the, the interference that will be happening from provincial and national government. Uh, the idea of uh, one plan, one government, it is a good idea, but how we uh, operationalize it, we have to still think about it. Yeah, and it's such a long way from parliament down to the citizen in the street to be able to do that and it, the, the message the the impact the the power of, of delivery just gets watered down in the process and that's even forgetting about corruption and and other operational inefficiencies aside that now i see noah's could raise another question over here and uh, let me see this do you think the request by the presidency to ask the us to professionalize the public sector will work and i'm not sure whether us here means university of Stellenbosch or the united states so i'm not sure but uh, um, it, it, it's, it's, it has, I, I'm, I'm not aware of this request, so this is catching me on the blind side, which often happens in the United States. Okay. So, so the, it seems like the president, our president, has, has asked the United States to help professionalize the public sector. Um, is this going to work? Is this going to happen in the context of relationships with Russia and goodness knows what all going around there? Um, can, we, can we extract something out of this? Pink, you wanted to. You look like you 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 keen to 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 throw something at our panelists. Yeah. Maybe yeah, I'll. I was actually just. Okay, lost. you got to rescue us there, Petro. Okay, go ahead, rescue. <laughs> us. I'm risking my ass as always. If I look at the current municipality, I think if I look at privatization, number one. And I look at the total institutional review to actually have a better balance between leadership and your lower tier workers. Um, I mean, if I take the municipality and they give me this job, I will, I think I can turn it around. I think you need to get somebody to actually see what the people do, how they do, on what level do they do it and how do we do it so and actually what do we give the people and what what is our resources and what is our outcomes um i think in terms of this um even looking back at the fact that the municipality at the stadium um decentralized the municipal owned entities i think it was the biggest mistake that they made because all of a sudden all the the different uh, uh, jobs are, are um, duplicated in different entities. So you get a person who phones a customer in Joburg Water, one in Joburg Roads, one in Electricity, one in 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 Joburg Core, one in the theater, and it's all duplication of work, which is actually a waste of resources and times, as well as if I look at the the skills, which we talked about uh, earlier, um, in terms of the skills, I don't think the people lack the skills. The people are placed in the incorrect positions. They have skills to do a certain job, but, the, but they're placed in a job where they don't have the skills that might be used somewhere else so i've seen all this nice things happen and yes we got the outcomes of all the exercises but we haven't implemented what we found could help the municipalities i don't know if i answer this question but in my meaning um that is that is where we should go to thank you I think Professor Nibu, if I can come in here, um, just listening to these challenges, how, how do you feel the, the private sector can actually assist in, in addressing some of these challenges, especially with regards to uh, 
processes and governance. For me, I think the private sector has a role to play in terms of assisting governance, especially with their processes, to streamline their processes. Private sector would have a better turnaround processes, would have a better process flow. And I think they, in terms of their value chain, they would, uh, we can learn from them. We, we can really learn from them. Uh, I am not sure whether the use of consultants would help. I, in my view, I think it is a waste of uh, resources that could be uh, could be rechanneled properly, uh, but the issue of professionalism, uh, professionalization of the public sector, especially local government, I think it is an important issue. You have currently you have people that are sitting in positions of authority, without the requisite skills, the prerequisite skills, and all of that. And this talks to ensuring that you help those people get the qualifications that they require. It also ensures that you help them uh, to get the experience that is required through partnering with universities, through partnering with uh, uh, colleges, institutions of higher learning that can assist municipalities with empowering with skills. Of course, one must guard against what has happened in uh, Fort Hay, uh, when you do that as well. Uh, so it must be in such a way that it does not uh, get to be problematic in how you do it. Yeah. I could circle back to something we, 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 we touched on earlier on is around the, the, the other the terrible word, the P word, privatization. And we look at organizations like ESCOM and we look at the SABC and I go for a little drive through my suburb, which is not a particularly affluent suburb. And I see solar panels, PV panels on top of roofs. And that in fact is a sense is a privatization of ESCOM in a very small scale, because once those people have gone on to PVs, they are unlikely to come back on the ESCOM grid at some time in the future. And the same thing too with SABC, it's, it's a proliferation of TikTok, YouTube, of Netflix and all the other sources out there, which almost short circuits there. So there's a privatization that's happening in that process. So there's a, a definite market source more market force, uh, you know, if you want to put a, 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 a portrait model on top of this in terms of competitive intensity, I mean, that's it, driving people coming up with their own solutions. I'm going to short circuit what this is, whether it's private security companies as opposed to, to, to policemen and things like that over there. And that's, that's, that, that is, is, is happening, that pro pseudo privatization is happening in a very unstructured and, and, un managed away, which I think could have severe problems for us down the track. Um, and that, that, that worries me over there because there are certain things that government should be doing, which the private sector should not be doing. And there probably are some things that the government is doing that the private sector should be doing. But I don't get the sense of that. And there's, there's a consistent thing of, of inefficiencies of people are not performing up to the standards. And I think that is the, the basis on which Dion Maharaj has put a question forward over here. And Dion Maharaj's question here is it's a very technical one, but I think it has implications which we might want to follow on. And he asks, is the TOS grade and job description evaluation system working in municipalities in your view? And I, that has to go to, to, to Dr. Smith there. And uh, she, she's sending me messages uh, with a frown on her face. <laughs> Thank you, James. <clears throat> In my view, the job descriptions are, well, they, they're fine, but, but they're not applicable. They, they don't actually hold you down and responsible for what you're actually doing. It's all just a matter of compliance and of this person does this, so you present the, the, your, your um, performance review, you get your documentation from this. So what you actually do, not what you measured on in your job. And a lot of people, and I'm saying again, the people have the capability to do the job they are trained in. In the, in, in the municipalities, and I'm talking about Cape Town, Twan and Joburg, they have proper job descriptions, but it is, it is malicious compliance. It's, it's really, it's a waste of time. You get three days for performance, uh, for 400% for performance, which people are, are actually of the view, why should we do this? Because what are three days? And then um, if, I, if I look at our job grading, it's gone to a task uh, uh, system. But if I still take even the people who, who um, um, works with me, if I look at the job descriptions, it, 
it's not relevant to what they really do. It's based on something they got somewhere on Google or whatever. You know, Dr. Google is a wonderful tool. But but it, it, it doesn't put you down to say, this is how I've done it. And you are not measured um, properly on, on your job description. So, so performance, uh, I don't know, I've, I hate the performance management system in, in the city of Johannesburg. I don't believe in it. I don't believe that it actually measures what the people put into their jobs. Because some people will sit there and they've got a month-end responsibility, which is doing month-end reports, and they measure for every day's work on that. So they're not working during the month. They're only working on month end. So you tell me, James, and I'm asking the students here, how can you have a person doing a month in job, doing a couple of month in reports, and get 100% salary and performance? So that is my question in the municipality. And I mean, in my PhD, when I did this research on performance, everybody, I'm talking about senior managers, which I had interviews with, confirmed this. So it's, so it's scary to think that there's people sitting doing nothing and they get paid. It's yes, scary. That's, that's very disturbing over there. I mean, I was hoping we would have something light and bouncy and shining and, and happiness as we get to the end of this. And, and no, it's, it's, again, um, it's, it's because of what you're saying, it points to a number of things. And then this is what, what, what Dion has, has brought up this week. Because it's, it's, what we're talking about is it is a structural issue that the design of the structure of the organization and the workflow, the passage of work through that organization hasn't been systematized in that particular way. Now, granted, the municipality is a very complex organization. I mean, it's, it's, yes. it has all sorts of nuances which you couldn't get in a public organization. And the whole thing of accountability is different. But again, what we've come back to in this is around dealing with accountability and consequence management that you actually, if you don't deliver what you're meant to be doing, then there's some consequence for that. Either you get trained in how to do it, or you get some sort of improvement process, or you get a disciplinary or warning for poor performance or whatever it might be around that. And that seems to be a part of the inability of, of government service to actually have teeth in it to hold people to account to get them to do their work. A, a friend of mine, he has a very, a very unfortunate method for this. He says you've got to hold people's feet to the fire, which is a terrible metaphor. And I, I, I'm, as I'm saying it, I wish I hadn't said it, but it's that sort of thing that there has to be some consequence if you don't deliver on what you need to, to talk about there. Um, are, there are there pockets of, of, of great success in our country where we can look to where these things are working and that, that, that we, we, have, we have some hope that we can model on, on activities at whatever level of government it is over there? What, what can we look for? What, what's a happy thought? What's a happy prospect that we can put to, to our conversation today? Can I say something? I believe that the municipality can change. And I believe if we've got the right people in the right position, doing things, uh, let's say, first of all, starting with the institutional review and putting the right processes, putting people to positions where they fit, where it suits them. I believe it can change. I've never been negative uh, towards local government. I believe that somewhere there's a bright light. And I've been in local government quite some time. And I've seen it going from good to worse. I've really seen it going down. But I believe our even our politicians, if they put their heads together and they work together and they look at a good model for business, it shouldn't just be a local government model. It should be a good, sustainable business model. They can implement it and turn it around. Okay, a sustainable model out there. And there's obviously some 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 resolutive clauses that need to be addressed there before we go down that route and we have that there. Um, Professor Devo, I can see you, you you want to develop that further. No, I, I think I am covered uh, by Dr. Uh, Smith's yeah, uh, point yeah. that you raised, but I, I wanted to also indicate that uh, we've seen uh, in the Western Cape, for example, a number of municipalities that have functioned very well uh, have appointed people with their requisite competencies. Uh, they've uh, separated politics from administration. Uh, contrary to popular belief, one of the best performing municipalities fine in the rural Eastern Cape 
And uh, one of uh, the things that one can uh, actually um, pick up from that municipality is that it has, their senior managers have been there for long. Their retention rate is very high. And also uh, the space between politics and administration is very clear. And I think if that can work in a municipality of that nature and you apply it in all municipalities, that could help us taking us forward. That's, that's such a lovely uh, opportunity. And then I wish you'd mentioned the name of that municipality so we can give them a shout out and tell them the good work they're doing there. Uh, but uh, that, that's, that's, and you see a couple of things you've said it out there. One is they've actually been around and they've got the institutional knowledge. They know the systems. They've been through a number of year ends. They've been through a number of MTF progresses, et cetera, et cetera, the budgeting process. They've been through the cycles, et cetera. They're conversant with the legislation. They've seen the application of the legislation and there's a very clear separation of, of administration from politics over there. And um, maybe that, that's, that's, that's where it starts. And I mean, so many of big important developments in our country have started off in the Eastern Cape. And, you know, we do know a large part of our democracy, our way of life, our understanding of the world to things that have come out of the Eastern Cape. So maybe this is another thing that's going to come out of the Eastern Cape that's going to, to take us forward into, a, into a, a, a better world, a place, because we're still trying to find the joy in our democracy, aren't we? we we're trying to find that, as I said, we, as a country, we're probably a, a late adolescent, you know, with all the problems of that and anger and temper tantrums and behavioral things of it. And we can understand that, but it is something we have to look forward to. And what you're telling me is that it is not doom and gloom out there. We need to find these pockets of, 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 of achievement and pockets of example. We're coming towards the end of our conversation now. This is always this sad thing over here because we're just starting to get into these things. And I know we could go on for at least another hour or two. Um, to Dr. Smith and to Professor Ndevu, is there something you'd like to leave behind with us today? There's something that you wanted to talk about, but we just never got to that part in the conversation. Or we were talking about something and then the conversation went another way and you couldn't make the point you wanted to. Is there something you'd like to leave with us in the room that you would want to add that you haven't been able to or something that you said, this is an important message I need to put out with people out there? And let's hear what that is out there, because I think that's, that's, that, that's it's important that you... you, you You've got an important message to tell us, and we want to hear that. And you can fight amongst yourselves, so you Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, from my side, if I look at, I've been in the private sector as well as the uh, public sector. If I look at the public sector, the good people are there. And it's important for everybody to know that there's people in that sector or in that arena looking after the, the uh, public looking after the community. So it's not all just a bad apple. And that's why I say I believe it can turn around. And if any of the students wants to pursue their studies in this field, it is a fantastic field. You learn a lot. The careers are very good. Um, the benefits for employees are good. Um, the municipalities or local government also give subsidized education. So there's constant learning and studying. It's just sometimes you are being held back by the difficult political uh, circumstances and the change, because there's constant change there. People want to change things the whole time. And if we have a little bit of stability, it, it will be good. But really, it's a good field to pursue as a career or in, in the academic field. It's good to study and, and go and research municipalities. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for putting that plug in for students. I think Jesse Hink was, was delighted when you put that in there. And I think it's, you know, government is where the experience it gives the basis on which you can live your life, whether you're working as a civil servant or as an entrepreneur, we are working for a company, or whatever your role is, without good governance at all the levels of government going through them. For us, as ordinary citizens, it's local government that eats us. When the rubbish doesn't get collected, or the stormwater drains overflow, or whatever it is, then it starts affecting us over there with potholes in the road. But when those things are resolved, it allows us to experience part of the good life that's important, that we can do the things we need to do, we can live the type of life we like to live over there. And I think 
I think that is where we where it's so important that institutions around the country are not just just a still in Bosch and, and Regenesis, but we continue to produce leaders, people who have the technical competence, understanding the expertise. And it's like a little dripping tap, you know, a little drop of water doesn't make anything, but you let your tap drip for a whole year and you see how much money you have to pay for that. And it's the same compounding effect of this over there. And that's, I think, is it's a very powerful message you've left with us there. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Right, Professor Endeavour, you, you've now got a chance to, to tell us all about the wonderful things your institution does and what you can do for people. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a difficult one coming <laughs> after Dr. Smith's one. But I think um, all I can say to our students uh, really is that uh, only they can uh, they can go out there and make a difference. They need to be, know that uh, public sector needs people that have uh, the qualities that they have, the qualities that they are learning uh, from this world-class institution. And they can take that and help our municipalities to turn around. So. Uh, Maya Angelou talks about um, people forgetting what you say, people forgetting what you do to them or for them, uh, but people never forget how you make them feel. And working in the public sector is about public trust, is about ensuring that you make people feel better off uh, when they come out of your office or when they interact with you. And that, I think, it's what our students should uh, be geared up to do. Thank you. A Thank profound you. comment out there, and I think it echoes back to the old Bhaktapile principles around that of what people can expect and what is this. And in my experience, it's the Bhaktapile principles have, have sort of been diluted and watered down a little bit. They don't seem to be as upfront as they used to be around that, and I think that that's unfortunate, but we can, we, we can always revive that again. Um, it is, yeah, the, the time is catching us now, but I think Henke wants to to, to just bring this all together and, and, and to reflect on some of the things, the, the pathways we've walked down, the roads we've crossed, the bridges we've we've stood on over and looked down at the waters below. Henke, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Paulson. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for this final opportunity. Uh, I think to summarize, uh, to me, what has really come from today's session and Professor Devu's uh, summed it up in, in one word, uh, one sentence rather, is to say, can we separate or differentiate politics from management? And I think once we get to a point where this is possible within both the public and local government sectors, I think we are on the right path. And it really warms my heart to, to hear the, the positivity coming from you, Dr. Smith, in terms of whether we can actually make this change and uh, implement changes in terms of training and development. And we as Regenesis uh, strive to, to add value in this regard. And we, even though we may be, as Mr. Forson says, just a drop in the bucket, uh, we believe that we are preparing leaders um, in all our uh, various departments, but specifically looking at our School of Public Management, we believe that one day leaders uh, in your various public sectors in the local governments, even at presidential level, will come from Regenesis. And we believe that we are preparing them, not just for, not just in terms of their theoretical knowledge, but also preparing them to be better leaders in terms of the EQ, EQ, uh, IQ, all of the different cues, uh, into which, which I'm sure will stand them in good stead wherever they may go. So uh, from our side, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to wrap up today's session. Uh, Professor Ndevu, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for the wonderful insights that you have provided us. Uh, I think uh, everybody who has attended here today has learned a lot about uh, the inner workings of both the local government and the public sector, and have also enjoyed your insights, uh, even though uh, you uh, you yourselves may not have the influence to change these things uh, right off the bat and uh, make an immediate impact. I think we've all been given a lot of clarity as to what can be done and we just need to, to make sure that the relevant stakeholders buy into these practices and ensure that uh, best, man best financial management practices are implemented throughout. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Mr. Forson, thank you very much for for your time and effort today in hosting this session. Uh, we as the School of Public Management at Regenesis do really appreciate your efforts.
Oh, that thank is you very much. Uh, I think you. That, you, that you all are feeling well and have a lovely afternoon. Good. Thank, no, you, thank very you very much. much for thank that. you. Before you all disappear over here, and again, to the audience out there, thank you very much for being here. It's, it's, you're, what you've been able to do is see right into the engine room. Of the, these are people who deal with these things all the time. You've got that, that, right, that there. Now, in the old days before COVID, we'd all be sitting in a room and there'd be a little podium and chairs and everything over there. And we get to this stage of the thing, we'd come along with little bags little bags with the crinkle paper on the top in each one of you a gift to you, Dr. Smith, and to you, Professor Endeavour. But we can't do that now because it's digital. But what our events team are going to do to you is send you a book. It's a book written by our chairman, Professor Dr. Marco Sharavania. It's around the secrets of success. And it's just a little memento, a little something that will, will encourage you. It's something you can dip into and read about things, little aspirational, motivational things for you to, to work at. And who knows, before too long, we will actually be able to meet in person. And I look forward to, as, as, as does Henk, and the rest of the Regenist team to continuing this because both of you are doing important work out there. Um, it, it's you shouldn't be discouraged. You sometimes it's terribly frustrating, but you are making a difference, and we are all standing shoulder to shoulder together to take our country forward and to put in place the type of society which we can all be proud of and which our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren can be happy with. So, again, from me to everybody, thank you so much. It's been really great. Uh, lovely and have a lovely afternoon you now have a chance to catch up on all those emails and text messages and from us at Regenesis to our audience and to our panelists we thank we do you good afternoon and have a lovely day thank you so much thank you very much thank you and bye thank you. bye bye bye, -bye. all the best look after yourselves right. and our <laughs> panelists look after yourselves and watch the space for the next exciting event to come along good thanks <laughs> thank you Right, yeah, all the best. Goodbye, everybody. Bye bye.